Hi, my name is Greg Dooley. I'm a Michigan football historian. Uh, I write a blog called mvictors.com. I also do some public speaking and at alumni events and things like that, really about Michigan football history. And what I've always tried to do is find different ways to bring that history forward uh, for people to consume. Um, it's not the most popular topic uh, covering Michigan football, but it's something that I like to do. And there's certainly a niche following uh, for, for my fellow historians or people who love history. So recently I had the idea of bringing a different way to bring history to you, namely around something that many of us do is the collections we have and the things we collect, the items we uh, scour eBay for. Um, for many of us, that's filling a man cave, as we call it, of Michigan stuff. And what I wanted to do was really get in touch with the hobby itself, and namely with a lot of the collectors, uh, the top collectors who I've gotten to know a little bit over the years, and really understand not only their collections themselves, but a little more of their personal history, why they started collecting, some of the things that they collect, maybe get um, American Picker style into some of the actual categories of collectibles that Michigan fans collect and talk about that and give them a forum uh, really to talk about what they need, what they look for, and really what drives them as fans. So uh, call this a pilot episode. And what I'd like to do today is kind of use myself as an experiment. And we're in my office right now uh, in Michigan, outside Ann Arbor. And I, of course, also have a collection. I wouldn't put this on the class or category of some of the people that hopefully we'll meet. Uh, in this series, but I obviously do have quite a few things. You can see some of them behind me. So what I want to do is is walk around my office a little bit and really approach uh, kind of looking at my collection through the lens or through kind of the style that I like to approach some of the other collectors when we're looking at their stuff. This is one thing I have in my office. Um, it probably should go in the basement, but it's pretty heavy. <laughs> This is an actual locker from uh, the Schembecker Hall renovation. Actually, I think it was two renovations ago um, where they ripped out the old lockers. This thing is very heavy, but this is an old locker that actually used to be uh, in Schembecker Hall, obviously not in the stadium, but in the practice facility. Um, it has his number on it, and uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't mean that, say, Jake Long or John Jansen used this locker. Maybe they did. I think it was just the locker number. Um, but the locker works. I actually keep stuff in it. I keep shoes and things in it. And it's a pretty cool item um, because I, one thing I like about it is that there's actually a practical use for it. I actually keep some of my stuff in it and use it. Um, no, I don't have any illusions that I was a Michigan football player, but you know, when I come here in the morning, I grab my shoes, my backpack, whatever. Um, I am a credentialed member of the football media. And I've always kept uh, my credentials from over the years and a lot of the road games I've been to. Um, why? And this is probably something that I would get into when I talk to other collectors. Um, I don't know. It, it's a cool remembrance of some cool trips that I've taken. Obviously, a bunch of trips to the big house and things like that. Um, so kind of moving around. This is cool. So I don't collect autographs per se. I have a lot of books that are autographed by authors, but this is actually um, a jersey that I used to wear in college, and I actually went, I was at Michigan in school during that Fab Five era, which was a great time to be at Michigan, but I actually uh, saw Jalen Rose at the premiere of the Fab Five documentary uh, that aired, um, was that ESPN, I forget, but Jalen signed it for me, he even wrote Fab Five on it, which I'm not sure how often he does. Uh, but that was cool, um, and it's a cool remembrance for me of, of something that I owned, and then Jalen personalized it. Moving across here, so obviously a bunch of stuff on my bookshelf. Uh, I, again, I don't really collect autographs, but a lot of the balls up here were signed. John Beeline, Lloyd Carr. A lot of these are from community events. Uh, being in the Ann Arbor area, being associated with athletics, I do have been to a lot of these things, and it's cool. This is kind of funny. This one's signed. Uh, by H Coach Hutch of the softball team. Um, it's got Rick Leach's signature, and the reason that is is, is he, during a charity home run contest against uh, Jim Harbaugh, he hit this one out of the park. This is the ball. This is actually the ball. I think I've offered to give it to both of them. Nobody wants it, so it's here in my office. Books. 
A lot of us have books. That's very cool. One thing, being a historian, is that a lot of these guys will send me a pre-copy of their books to review, uh, to provide feedback on, including my friend John Bacon, um, my friend John Crick from Stag vs. Yost and Natural Enemies, and they'll give me a pre-copy. So some of these books were not released to the public, which is kind of a neat thing to have. Um, you know, your various knickknacks. I always like glassware. Uh, there's a practical aspect to it, like I mentioned in the uh, with the locker. You know, this is a glass that I can actually use on certain occasions, and this one is for the 1969 championship team, and this one is for the 1964 uh, 64 championship team and Rose Bowl team. This is an actual brick from Yost Fieldhouse, okay, or Yost Ice Arena as it is today. Built in 1923, there's a whole story. Um, about Yost's particular care about the color of the bricks that he used in, uh, in the field house, as it were, back in the day. Now, when they were building Glick, um, the practice facility, one of the construction guys noticed that, that the parapet or the top of the roof of Yost was falling, was leaning forward and needed to be repaired. They repaired it, but in doing so, a bunch of the bricks uh, were, were tossed inside down in front of the building. And I know that I'm, I'm not the only one, but several of us saw this pile of bricks and they wanted an actual brick from Yo's Fieldhouse, got one, and that's what that is. So that's a little funny. Um, the brown jug. Uh, many of you have read some of the research I've done on the little brown jug. It's obviously important to me. To me, and we're talking about memorabilia here, the jug itself is probably the ultimate piece of Michigan memorabilia, maybe college football memorabilia, you want to argue that, but obviously dates back to 1903. Um, this is, uh, of course, one of the replicas that you can buy. Speaking of the Little Brown Jug, this is a favorite of mine. Uh, this was basically how the jug used to look, that the original design on it. Uh, when Minnesota uh, founded it after the 1903 game, you've probably seen pictures if you follow this stuff, but it's a Michigan jug and captured by Oscar and the date, right? On the back, had the score, Minnesota 6, and a big number 6, and a small number 6 for Michigan. This hung in the athletic director's office for about um, six years before Michigan and Minnesota eventually played for it. And again, I've written about why they played for it and why they didn't, more importantly. But this is cool. So what, what this is is actually Jill Gordon, uh, who is uh, my friend and... Uh, uh, the woman who actually paints the score on the real brown jug and actually painted the new section on the real brown jug um, for when Michigan wins it, of course. She actually painted this for me from a picture, and I believe she signed the bottom. She did. Jill Gordon signed the bottom of it for me, which, again, has a personal touch. I love it, um, and it's, it's something cool that I'll have to show people and talk about. This little beauty was produced in the 30s uh, with this pin on top. This one's from 1934. Uh, these are real cool. Uh, the, you'll see the jugs themselves and you'll see the pin sold individually, but actually it was one piece uh, when they sold it. And I believe these were students from Minnesota trying to raise some money for their club or something. The whole thing dissolved. I wrote about it on invictors.com years ago, but these are highly collectible. The pins themselves will go between one and $200. The jugs between one and two and uh, one and two hundred dollars. I've never actually seen uh, someone sell a, a the piece together like this. I actually bought these separately. All right. Most Michigan fans have some sort of helmet, whether it's autographed or not. Mine is autographed, but not by whom you might think. All right. So I happen to know just from doing research and stuff that the Shut brand helmets that Michigan used to wear, and, and you probably know they're all hand painted, these aren't decals, uh, were painted and remanufactured and reconditioned every year um, in Oxford, Ohio. Why Oxford? Well, Bo and John Falk had a relationship with a company called Capital Varsity down there that, that did all the shut helmets for years, and even after Bo uh, moved on from coaching. Well, the guy who for, for years since the 70s who actually did the painting of the helmets is a guy named Russ Hawkins. And Dr. Sapp, Steve Sapperdanis and I went down to Oxford, actually met Russ, 
he actually painted up a couple of mock helmets for us and showed us how he did it. We videotaped the whole thing, but Russ signed this helmet for me in there, and I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but that's Russ Hawkins' signature right behind, oh, above the ear pad there. It's very cool. Uh, black and blue movie poster. Of course, this is the story of Gerald Ford and Willis Ward. Uh, I love it, so I had it mounted. Um, I've participated in a few of the, the, the segments on it, especially about what happened in the 30s during this game. Uh, and it, this means a lot to me because I feel like I had a little bit to do with kind of bringing this story back to life. I, of course, I didn't find this story about Willis Ward and what happened during the Georgia Tech game, but I wrote about it. And I feel like I had a, a hand in kind of popularizing uh, the story, which, which needs to be told. They did a really good job with the movie poster obviously with Yost and Ford and, and Ward on it. So what the black and blue documentary gets into is the whole incident uh, with, with the main character, Willis Ward, who's an African-American player. Uh, he's a track star, but he came to Michigan to play football. And uh, there was some controversy over uh, whether he could be on the team or not. Harry Kipke, the coach at the time, got him on the team. Uh, it, he's not the first African-American to play football at Michigan, but they're a bit of a long stretch. And the story goes is that Fielding Yost uh, made that happen, or made that not happen in this case. But he's not, Yost isn't the coach anymore, now it's Harry Kipke. Kipke wants Ward on the team, likes him, befriends him. Uh, he's on the team, comes to school to play football. But in 1934, Michigan plays Georgia Tech, and of course, uh, they have different views of African Americans, their place, and their place in the football field. And a controversy breaks out, um, and then some, and riots on campus basically debates, uh, uh, riots, things are thrown leading up to this game. Michigan eventually uh, sits war, uh, and it's a darker part of Michigan's history, but one of the things uh, that I like to do is really talk about really the truth. What, what, is, what is really uh, our history about? That story really gets down to it. It's not something you heard a lot about before the Black and Blue documentary came out, and I give a lot of credit to Brian Kruger and Buddy Morehouse, the guys who put that together. I thought they did a great job. Um, but it really tells that story. And uh, yeah, and so that's, that's why I like to, have, like to have this up on my wall. If there's a category of Michigan thing that I really collect, it is probably something you haven't heard about, which is this, this series of buttons or pins uh, that were issued by the athletic department uh, or the Athletic Association from about the late 1890s um, to about 1912, and then the Michigan Union took over from about 1912 to 1944. And what they issued are these really small pins that, if you can see, typically over the years had a block M on them, and they had a year. And I can get more into that, but this is something that I probably have the premier collection out of any private collector um, of this series of pins. And if the opportunity presents itself, I can show you some more pictures, but they have a real cool story. Um, for most of their history, they signified that you were a member of the union. Back then it was only men uh, could get to the front door and use all the services that the union had. It was a little different back then. They had a pool. They had uh, pool halls, which I think they still have, but food, shows, and it was actually a hotel uh, where out-of-town guests and alums could stay. With a life membership, you had privileges to stay at the Union. So it's a cool piece of Americana. Um, they obviously get valuable as you get older. Some, some of the ones, say, early 1900s and, of course, into the 1890s are very rare and very scarce. It's something I collect. Why? Which is something I want to get into with these collectors. I like this because it, again, had a practical purpose. It served a purpose in the day. Uh, these were all probably worn by students back then. There's a tie to the, to the athletic department. Uh, initially, these were to raise funds for the athletic department, and then the union adopted it. And um, obviously, the union is, is the center of culture um, for the students, or it was back then. So, uh, oh, the other thing I like about this is that they're very small. Unlike the locker, granted, it's probably the biggest piece of memorabilia you're going to see, um, but it's going to take Jake Long, Taylor Little Long, and um, John Jansen to move it out of here. These can fit in my pocket. 
Um, they also are very valuable. The ones from around the turn of the century can go as high as a couple hundred dollars and have recently on eBay. So that's something I like to collect too. This was a gift. Uh, I've been to a few Rose Bowls and seen Michigan play a few times. Uh, but obviously it's been a long time. This was a gift after the 2005 Rose Bowl, back when Rose Bowls were common, ubiquitous even. And um, of course, at the time, I didn't think this would ever be kind of a relic or something I would look at and uh, get kind of an emotional reaction to. But I do keep this in my office. Uh, I do want to go back to the Rose Bowl and it's been a long time. All right. so. Not all my stuff that I have is in my office, and like many collectors, I've moved a lot of stuff into a basement, and we finished our basement a couple of years ago, and it's it's not all primarily Michigan stuff, that's never going to happen, um, but I do have a few cool things that I think are cool uh, down here to show you. Uh, this is uh, basically wall art, which is a depiction of the sheet music for the victors, and this is, I think from around 1904. I assume these came out earlier than that. Um, the team depicted is, is the 1904 team, but the victors, of course, is dedicated to Michigan football team in 1898. Why is that? Well, it was our first, uh, what was then the Western Championship, Big Ten Championship today. Uh, we beat Stag 12-11 in Chicago. Louis Elbel, who wrote the victors, was a student at the time, wrote the song in the way home. It was later performed, I think a year or so later, and of course became the Victors Our Fight song. But I love the wall art and the team photo, the colors. Um, this is basically like a fat head um, of a high res scan of some old sheet music, and you got Willie Heston and Yost and the rest of the boys there. So I like that a lot. So this is kind of cool. Back to my kind of enjoyment of the Little Brown Jug history. This is the Minneapolis Tribune uh, on November 1st, which is the day after the game, which of course is when the reports came out about the games because they didn't, didn't have the internet and stuff like that. So uh, it's basically the Tribune um, and kind of talking about the game. It has a game chart on it, the play chart, and it's, it's probably something that most Minnesota fans would love to have. Uh, it really talks about how Minnesota effectively won the game, even though the game ended in a 6-6 tie which really gets into why they took the jug in the first place. They were so happy to stop Yost or at least slow him down because this is 1903. Uh, this is mid-season-ish. Actually, yeah, mid-season-ish. Um, but to that point, Yost had not lost a game since he had been in Ann Arbor. In fact, after this, didn't lose one till the last game of the 1905 season. But I like this. Basically just mounted it in between two pieces of plexiglass. Um, I think I got it on eBay, which is where I get a lot of stuff, but sources of memorabilia, where people buy their stuff, I think is an interesting topic for the, because for the deep collectors and the guys who really go for hardcore stuff like autographs and game worn things, they really go to other sources. Um, for a lot of the jewelry and probably something I should do for those pins I talked about uh, is look at things like estate sales and stuff like that. I just don't have a ton of time to do that, but I do have a network of people that kind of keep an eye out for me. All right, so here's one more thing that I have in my collection, and I give credit to Jack Briegel, who, as far as I know, has the most complete collection of Michigan football ticket stubs out there. Well, this is, this is kind of how Jack, um, which hopefully we'll get a chance to see Jack's collection in his basement, but um, I, I wanted something similar uh, in my basement but I didn't want the whole thing. Jack basically has every ticket stub. He's just missing a few, and we'll talk about which ones he's missing, um, which I also want to be part of this, is really to get the collectors to say, what are they really looking for or missing out there, which may help them find someone and, and connect them with someone who has it. But what Jack, what I asked Jack for was, instead of all the ticket stubs, I asked him for one ticket stub from each season of since Michigan Stadium. So one from each season, and what it does is, it starts, of course, in 1927, and then moves across in these display cases all the way to the present day. And slowly, I've been grabbing some ticket subs that mean a little bit more to me. Like I have the 1934 Georgia Tech game, for instance. Um, and then, of course, you know, as we move on here, I've actually attended some of these games, right? Uh, I think my first uh, 
game that I attended was in the late 80s at Michigan Stadium. Um, but I think they're cool. I think they're cool as a wall art piece um, to tell stories uh, and all that. And so lately, and like this year, I, I chose the Notre Dame game ticket just because that was such a fun game. Um, but that's, that's what I have in the basement, and I really like it. Uh, I've got plenty of room here. I can actually add six of these little little tickets um, in a given row if, when I need to add more space, but it's something I've got, I get a kick out of. So thanks for checking this out. Uh, what I really would like, if you want to help, give me your feedback. What do you like about this whole concept? Uh, what would you add? What would you change? For collectors out there or for, for people with their man cave, if you have a story or you want to tell your story, you know someone who, who has a story to tell, get in touch with me either in the comments, uh, mvictors.com, mvictors on Twitter. Uh, and that's really what I'm looking for uh, is, is, is your reaction, your help, and I look forward to this project. Thank you.